verse 19. Okay, uh, sister, uh, you start reading. Tita, you do the reading. Okay? 20 and 19. Yes, we go. Jesus wants the disciples to go on and baptize every nation, 
in the titles of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, then he would definitely would have would have said baptizing them in the names. Now he would use the plural forms, names, and he would have never used name. Now look at here. If you just focus on the word name, it's not a plural; it's a singular. Okay, you can underline that. It says baptizing in the name. It's a singular. Baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Which means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost have just one name. Yes. And the disciple knew that the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. And therefore, from the day of Pentecost, according to the Bible, and according to the Church that the New Testament church, the early church baptized all nations in the name of Jesus Christ. In the previous class, our sister did that already uh, read out from the book of Acts. We surveyed the entire book of Acts, starting from the Acts chapter 2. For example, in the still in Acts 2 38, it says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And he shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Acts chapter 8. Them, the Gentiles, all right. Even the Gentile peoples started believing in Lord Jesus Christ after receiving the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then, according to Acts 10 48, Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and we go a little bit further when we study Acts chapter 19, verse 2 to 5, we can clearly see that John's the Baptist disciple, John the Baptist disciple, were given a rebaptism. They had received the baptism already, but that was not a John's baptism. Now, what is John's baptism? John's baptism is immersive baptism, but it does not have the formula. That means John was not baptizing the people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Neither he was baptizing them in Jesus' name. He simply said, believe on him who would come after me is greater than I. I will decrease and he will increase. And then he would simply immerse them into the water and the Jordan River. Alright? But we can also understand, including Zod's baptism, is also immersive baptism. Now let's find out that one from the Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> Look at here in verse 16. Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. You see that? That means John's baptism is also very much immersive baptism. Because otherwise, how could Jesus come out of the water? Are you guys clear now? Because if I do a sprinkling baptism or pouring baptism, then you cannot come out of the water. If you, can, if you come out of water, that means it is not a pouring baptism, it is not a sprinkling baptism, but rather it's immersive baptism. Yeah? yeah. So one of the evidence that I've shown you here in Matthew 3.16 is that the Bible said that Jesus came out of the water, which means John's baptism was also immersive baptism. However, it does not have a baptism of formula. He did not baptize the people in Jesus' name, not in the Father's own Spirit, because okay, the Father's own Spirit baptism started after the 300 years after the apostles. All right, but when we talk about the baptism in Jesus' name, the baptism in Jesus' name starts only from the day of Pentecost. So this was a prior to the Pentecost, before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So John's baptism does not have baptism of formula, but it does have a mode of baptism. The mode of its baptism was immersion, as we can see now. And also, when you study from Acts chapter 19, it's very clear that the 12 disciples of John the Baptist, Baptist made Apostle Paul. Now we can turn the Bible to Acts chapter 19. that while Apollos was at Corinth, 
all having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. Now verse 2 states, He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Verse 3, He said it unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And he said unto Zod's baptism. Then said Paul, Zod verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see that? Now, according to verse 7, all and all the men were about 12. So these are the 12 adults, all right, disciples of John the Baptist. So Apostle Paul asked this question to them, have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said unto Paul, we have not so much heard that there be any Holy Ghost. And right after that, Apostle Paul said, Unto them, what baptism are you baptized with? And they said, Zon's baptism. You can see in verse uh, 3. And they said, Unto Zon's baptism. Then said Paul unto them, Zon merely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him to come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, if Jesus Christ really wanted his disciples to go out and baptize all nations in the Father, Son, and the Spirit, then why is that the disciples, apostles, and the early church never baptized the people in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? As a matter of fact, according to the Bible and history, you can study from Genesis to all the way to the book of Revelation. You can study from Matthew to the book of Revelation. You can study 10,000 years. You can study from the day you born until you die. You will never come across the early church baptism, uh, in giving baptism in the Father, Son, and the Spirit. The New Testament church never baptized anybody in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's not even one person who received the baptism of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And this is the reason why I'm saying again, if you already believe in Jesus Christ, if you have a faith in Jesus Christ, if you, if you have already repented, and now believe in Jesus Christ, and, but if your baptism is a formula, if your baptism is not a Bible way, then why don't you get it right? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. There are people who say that baptism, re-baptism is not biblical. I would say it's very much biblical. If your baptismal formula of your baptism form is not the Bible way, if it is not performed, if it is not done in the name of Jesus Christ for the purpose of remission of your sins, then you should get it right. You should go and receive the Bible with baptism because your previous baptism, the baptism that you receive is nothing but denomination baptism. It is a minimum baptism. So even though you receive already that <coughs> minimum baptism, <coughs> but if you're not baptized in the Bible way, then you should get, you should go and uh, receive the rebaptism, and you should get it right. Exactly in Acts chapter 90, that's exactly what they did. The 12 disciples of John the Baptist, they already believed. They already believed in the Messiah, on the Lord Jesus. But what was wrong with them is that they had only received Zon's baptism. Because Zon was saying to the people that you should not believe in me, but you should believe in yeah. the one who come after me. All right, that is the Lord Jesus. And he gave them repentance baptism. So what was Zon's baptism? It's repentance baptism. Even though they had been received immersion baptism, but the, but the baptism formula was not correct. And therefore, Paul gave them the re-baptism and he baptized them, all of them, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we can clearly understand 
<coughs> even if we do not go <coughs> to the historical references, even if we don't go down to the insertion screen, still you can see, even if you just depend on your, on your, uh, you know, the English Bible that you're having right now, right? even if you just depend on your own Bible, you can still clearly see that the early church, the New Testament church, baptismal formula or the baptism formula was not in the Father, Son, or the Spirit. It was always in the name of Jesus or Jesus Christ. Then why is that the people to be Christians are so reluctant to get right with the Lord? Why is that the people are not willing to obey the Bible baptism or the biblical baptism and why they are still ignoring the biblical baptism? On the other hand, we said we believe in Jesus Christ. We all the say that Jesus is my everything. He is my Lord, my Savior, my uh, my my. Uh, he is my King. He is my God. He is my everything. We don't have any problem saying that. And if you don't have any problem uh, saying that Jesus is my Savior, my Lord, my everything, then why are you not obeying the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because Jesus said, baptize them in the name. He did not say, baptize them in the names. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 So the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is Jesus. No one can deny that. Amen. And we also understand the title, Father is not a name. Father itself is a title. For example, I'm a father to my children, but father is not my name. Some people even greet me as a father. Because Roman Catholic priests and the presenter in charge were usually greeted as a father in the Catholic Church. There were some people who even greet me on the road when I'm, you know, when we used to go to some you know, prayer meeting, that some of the Christians would just greet me. Not with, uh, with the title of pastor, but they would say father. All right, but that's not my name. Father is a title. Yeah. So I'm a father for my children, and very much I'm also the son for my own father. Yes. My name is also my name is not a son, but my father would never call me my name and say my son. Yes. Okay, when he said he's my son or my son, when he used to call me son, come here. That means I know that he's calling me, even though he does not invoke my name only. Still, I knew that my father is calling me because he's a son of oh, yes. Because I'm a son of my father. And I will have, also have a spirit, but that's not my name. Or for example, I'm a husband to my wife. For my wife, I'm a husband, but that's not my name. In the same way, the name of the father is not a father, but Jesus. The name of the Son is not the Son, but Jesus. Now the reason why God became a Son is because in order to be our Savior, that God was manifested in the flesh and became a Son. You cannot say God is a Son, because every Son has the beginning. Whereas the deity of Christ, the deity of God is that God does not have, if you study from the Bible, okay, when you study attributes of God, God cannot be addressed with a title called Son. Because son always had a baby. <coughs> son is inferior to the father. So then I mean, why do we call God a son? Because he manifested in the flesh. So the manifestation of God in the flesh is known as the son of God. So he is a son because he, and the term son is indicating not the deity of Christ, but indicating the humanity of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Never even the prophet Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, son is given. So what does the term son indicate? The term son indicates the humanity. What does the term father indicate? The term father indicates his deity. Amen. Amen. Because he's the creator of all things. He's the source of all things. He's the maker of all things. And therefore, he is our everlasting Father, our eternal Father. Yeah. 
And we also understand the essence of God is the Spirit. So the Holy Ghost, the name of the Holy Ghost is not the Holy Ghost, but the name of the Holy Ghost is also Jesus. Amen. And we can all clearly see from the Bible, nowhere in the Bible says the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity. The Bible clearly says that according to 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17, now the Lord is that Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, as we can see from the Philippians chapter 1, to the Bible in Philippians 1 19, it clearly says that <coughs> the Holy Spirit is not other but the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. You can read from the Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. It says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Everybody can underline that. Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen? So who is the Spirit of Jesus Christ? The Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is known as the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can also understand from, okay, from the Gospel of John chapter 14. <coughs> okay, Sister Bakili will do the reading John 14 verse 16. Everybody underline that. John chapter 14 verse 16. John chapter 14 verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. All right, thank you so much. So as a man here, Jesus saying, I will pray the Father. Oh my God. If Jesus is praying to the Father, that means he's not God. That means he's inferior to the Father. How can God pray to another God? Yeah. <clears throat> Understand, God never prays. God answers our prayer. But Jesus speaking here as a man, and then he said, I will pray the Father. Amen? Amen. Jesus right here for praying in Gethsemane Garden. He prayed it oftentimes when he was on the earth. So as a man he prayed, but as God, he answers our prayer. Then what Jesus said again in John chapter 14, in verse 14, if he said, ask anything in my name, he said, I will do it. That means I will answer your prayer. Wow. As a man we pray, as God he answers the prayer. So you need to understand the two nature over here. And like you and me, it does not have just one nature, we have two nature. Why do the people are always confused while studying the Gospels? Why do the many theologians and pastors are very confused when they study the New Testament? It's because they fail to understand the distinction between the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ. We human beings have only one nature, correct? That's what we call human nature. Unlike you and me, that Jesus Christ does not have just one nature, but he has two nature. That's what we call humanity and divinity. He is both flesh and the spirit. So as a man, he said, I will pray. But as God, he answers the prayer. For example, as a man, he said, I'm thirsty for the water. But as God, he said, I'm the living water. Oh, yes. As a man, he said, I'm hungry. How can God be hungry? But as God, he said, I'm the living bread. I'm the bread of life. Amen. As a man, he was tempted by the devil. But as God, he cast out the devil. Oh, yes. You see that? As a man, he wept. But as God, he said, love is coming for us. Yes. Wow. All right? If Jesus Christ knew that he can raise the last rest, then why he should pray? Why he should pray? Human being, we are all that we have these emotions. So as a man, he wept. The shortest Bible verse in the New Testament is that Jesus wept. When our grandparents or when our loved one die, we all cry, we wept, isn't it? Because we know that then our loved one will never come back. And therefore, we cannot control our emotions and we all right. If Jesus named it, all right, 
the Lazarus, after a few moments, Lazarus will be, you know, he will be raised, and why he wept? As a man, he wept. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But as God, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. Amen. Therefore, as a man, he prayed, as God, he answers our prayer. Amen. So therefore, he said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, which means another helper. That it may abide with you forever. Which means, according to this word, that Jesus said, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit will abide with you forever. Right? But let us contrast this verse, which is in Matthew 28, verse 20. Who would abide with the disciple forever? Is it the Holy Spirit or Jesus? Here Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will abide with you forever. But when you study from the Matthew 28, verse 20, Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus Christ testified and declared in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I am. Wow. What is the next? Lo, I am with you always. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. John 4 and 16 is that the Holy Spirit will abide with me forever. But when it comes to Matthew 28, verse 20, before he ascends, and just before he was ascended to heaven, that Jesus finally declared and said to his disciple that I am with you forever, which means I will abide with you forever. Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So now we can understand. The Holy Ghost is not a third person, but the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's go down again to John the 14th. Look at here again in verse 18. Alright? He went on to say in verse 18, I will not leave you conformless. The Greek word for conformless means orphanless, which means fatherless or parentless. In other words, he said, I will not leave you as an orphan. So who are the orphans? Orphans don't have a mother and father. So Jesus said to his disciples, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come to you. That's really from a sister Zita when you do the reading. Uh, John 14 verse 18, I think that's that verse may say orphan, something like that. Just read up.
He never meant to say that you will see physically with our physical eyes. It means that we will know Him. Amen? Amen. We will understand and accept that He is our Savior, that He is our God. Amen. Amen. So therefore here, Jesus said, The world see me no more, but ye see me because I leave, ye shall also leave. And in verse 20, said, that daddy he shall know that I am the Father. That means, in that he shall know that I am the Father. That's what it means. Now look at here uh, what Jesus said in verse 20. At that you shall know that I am in my Father. That means you will come to know that I am the Father. Ye in me and I in you. Yes. Amen. This is what we call unions between the church and Christ. Amen. Becoming ones. Amen. Amen. That, that makes us a special people. A holy nation. Because unlike the people of this world, we don't just have this flesh, body, and the spirit, but we have the spirit of Jesus Christ as well. Amen. Amen. What makes you different from the non-Christians, from the other, from the people of this world, is that you have something very unique, something very special. You have the spirit of Jesus, whereas the other people don't have that spirit. Amen. But they also have the same thing. If you have a soul, they have a soul. If you have a body, they have a body. If you have a flesh, they have a flesh. But what makes you extraordinary, more special, is that you have the spirit of Jesus. Amen. And if you don't have the spirit of Jesus, that means you're not a Christian. Amen. Let's turn the Bible to Romans 8, 9. The Romans 8, 9 says very clearly, you can hear again. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not, the Spirit of Christ is not of this. That, it, that means that if you do not have the Spirit of Jesus, you don't belong to Him. Yes. And if you are not a believer, then you are not a Christian. A true believer would have the Spirit of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So that makes you, that makes us different from the people of this world because. They don't have the spirit of Jesus because they do not believe that Jesus Christ is Savior, that He's God, or He's the creator of this world. Amen? Amen. So therefore understand the Holy Ghost is not a third person, but a spirit of Jesus Christ. Yes. So therefore Jesus Christ said it very clearly to the disciples, baptizing them in the name, not in the names. Of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the disciple knew it that the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is, is Jesus, and therefore they go on to baptize every nation. From the day of Pentecost, they began to baptize all nations in the name of Jesus Christ for the purpose of the remission of sins. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So therefore, my therefore, my friend, baptism is very important something. Yes. And the people does not believe in baptism, they mean they don't believe in the gospel. Amen. Amen. Because when we are baptized, we are unified with Christ in his death, the burial, and the resurrection. Amen. And if we talk about gospel, what is the gospel? Gospel means the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Christ died, he was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel. But the question here is, how do we obey that gospel? How do we die with Christ? Because the day when I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I do not die with Him. Amen. It is important that you also believe in Him. At the same time, you also need to be unified with Christ in His death and the burial. Amen. Amen. In order to have the newness of life. In order to be buried with Christ, you cannot do that when you just believe, accept and believe in Jesus. If you accept and believe in Jesus, then without wasting your time, you must get, amen, the water baptism with immersive baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Because it's through the baptism in Jesus' name that you are unified with Christ in His death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen. That is not according to my philosophy and my opinion, that's according to the Bible. Let us turn the Bible to Romans chapter 2, verse 12. The Romans chapter 2 verse 12, that's, that's what exactly we see here. 
In the Romans chapter 2 verse 12, Sister Tita, you do the reading now again. Romans chapter 2 verse 12, what does it say? Romans it. chapter 2 verse 12, the Gentiles do not have the law of Moses. No, no, wrong, at the Colossians chapter 2 verse 12, sorry. Colossians, the book of Colossians. Yeah, Colossians. <coughs> the epistles of Colossians. The epistle of Paul. The Apostle to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can just read it down. It's alright. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Yeah, read loud. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Who has raised him from dead? Amen. Thank you so much, everybody. Now listen carefully. So here Apostle Paul said that you are buried with him in what? In believing, no. In accepting Jesus Christ as the Lord and saving, no. Amen. Amen. That you are buried with him in where? Baptism. Amen. Hallelujah. Where in that in the same manner. Also, you're risen with him through the oppressed, through the failure of the oppression of God, we're raising from the dead. In other words, also you're risen with him through the faith of the working of God. Because oppression means the work of God. Amen. Therefore, in Colossians 3 1 says, If he then be risen with Christ, wait a minute. What is Paul talking about? If he then be risen with Christ, where and when did the Colossian, the church of Colossi experience the resurrection with Jesus Christ? Where and where? Through the baptism. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And therefore Paul wrote a letter to the church of Colossi and he says it unto them. Look at here in verse 1. Colossians 3, 1. If you can be risen with Christ. Wow. If he then be risen with Christ. So the questions over here is where and when did the church of Colossae experience that resurrection with Christ? Where? When? When they were baptized. According to Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. So therefore, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have already know that Jesus Christ is your Savior, is your Lord God Almighty, if you now believe that Jesus is Lord God Almighty, that He is the only Savior, that means without wasting your time, you must go and get a baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Because it's through the baptism, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you are unified with Christ in His death, the burial and resurrection. You know, the Bible says, faith without word is dead. But remember, even Noah was saved by grace. <coughs> the Bible says that he had received the grace from God. Amen. Amen. But still, then, in order to be saved, Noah obeyed the commandments of God and he built the ark for 120 days. And after that, along with his family, he he received every, every instruction that is given by God. He obeyed all the instructions given by God. And finally, he entered into the ark. Amen. Hallelujah. So if you all believe in Jesus Christ, then we must do exactly what God wants us to do. Amen. That is to be baptized. I want you to turn the Bible again to Mark chapter 16. From the book of Mark, uh, the gospel of uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Sister, can you do the reading? Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He did believe and is baptized shall be saved, but he did believe not shall be them. Amen. Thank you so much. You can see that, uh, brothers and sisters, you can see that it's a all red color in your King of the Bible. Because this is, these are the words of Jesus Christ. Amen. The literally physical words of Jesus Christ. Therefore, you can see that it's in the red color. What does it mean? These are words of Jesus Christ. Yes. 
So Jesus Christ saved his, uh, his disciple, he that believed and is baptized. So if you say you believe in Jesus Christ, that means you must get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. <coughs> Therefore, here Jesus said, he that believed and is baptized. If I simply believe in Jesus and if I refuse to be baptized, then I am not a believer. Amen. That means I have the faith or the belief of the demons. I'm not willing to surrender my life to Jesus. I'm not willing to, you know, give my life to God. I'm not willing to sacrifice and to surrender to the Lord Jesus. So a true believer will always obey the commandments of God. Amen? So to believe in Jesus means to be baptized in the name of Jesus. If you say you believe, you have to understand, to believe in Jesus Christ is to believe in the gospel. Amen? And water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is a part of the gospel. Amen? Let me rephrase again. Listen carefully. To believe in Jesus is to believe the gospel. These are inseparable things. You cannot separate one another. You cannot just take one part, you cannot leave the other part. Just like if I want to take this marker, I cannot complain to the manufacturer people and the, the people who make this marker. I cannot say, I don't like this step. All I need is this. I cannot do that. If I want to take this marker, I need to, if I want to buy this marker, I must also accept even the cat as well. Amen. Yes. Because if they are all together, it's one marker. White wood marker. Amen. I cannot say I need only this and I don't want this. Because these are inseparable things. Yeah. If you don't want this, you cannot buy this. Because it comes in one packet. So. Yeah. so in the same way, I cannot say I just believe in Jesus, but I'm not obeying the gospel. So you need to understand to believe in Jesus is to believe the gospel. And water baptism in Jesus' name is part of that gospel. So let's throw the Bible again to uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 3 to 5. When you throw the Romans chapter 6, 3 to 5, you can clearly understand that to believe in Jesus is to believe the gospel and water baptism in Jesus' name is very much part of the gospel. Look at here in Romans chapter 6, verse 25. Knowing not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Amen. Let's refocus verse 3. Knowing not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. It does not say baptized into Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's a two different thing, right? It does not say baptized into Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you see the difference? Because Romans 6 3 does not say baptized into Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But rather, it says baptized into Jesus Christ. Amen. That means the Christian baptism was always in the name of Jesus Christ. Not just in the baptism, but in everything they do, in war and in deed. They do all things in Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus, or Jesus Christ. For example, they cast out demons in Jesus' name. They teach and preach in Jesus' name. Signs and wonders are performed in Jesus' name. They pray in the name of Jesus' name. They gather together in Jesus' name. They kids and print in Jesus' name and they baptize in Jesus' name. They do all things in Jesus' name because they are the people of the name Jesus. Amen. Because in the name of Jesus, they have the power. My brothers, brothers and sisters, please remember one thing. You may have the whole largest church you may be the member of that world largest church. You may be the member of local church, member of the second world largest church. But if you do not have the name Jesus, you are nothing. Amen. Yes. 
You may have your degrees and titles as an MD, MTH, PhD, double, PhD, double, 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 master degree holders. But yet, if you don't have the name Jesus, you are nothing. Amen. Without invoking the name Jesus, we can do nothing. Amen. Amen. Look at our, uh, our Nigerian brothers, South Africans, the black Christians. God used them in a mighty way. But each and every one of them, no matter which, which denomination they belong, whosoever is doing this ministry, all of them will say in the, in the name of Jesus, Master Jesus, hallelujah. Yes. Black people would often say Master Jesus anyway. Yeah. Huh? Correct, isn't it? <clears throat> Amen. They do all things in Jesus' name. And therefore God answers the prayer, you can see signs and wonder, deliverance are taking places. People receiving healing. Even in life, capture television, amen, not, not editing. Instead healing. And God can use them. Why? Because they believe in Jesus, they may be praying in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But if you would make us condition that you cannot make use the name Jesus, you can only use the Father's and the Spirit, then trust me, even one person will not be healed, and within 10 days their ministry will collapse. Because if you cannot use the name Jesus, you are nothing. Yes. Amen? Amen. The Satan can defeat you, you can do nothing against the devil. Because you have no power on your own to defeat the Satan. You can only defeat the Satan only in the name of Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus said, in my name, you shall cast the demons. Oh, yes. Praise the name of God. Hallelujah. Amen. But what, what really makes me wonder is that if we know it, that there is a power in the name of Jesus Christ, then why are we so reluctant to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Because the Word of God clearly tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all. That's read out from Sister Zita. Colossians 3 17. What did he say there? You don't have to believe in my word, my brothers and sisters. Okay, believe what the Bible says. Amen. Let's read Colossians 3 17. Colossians 3.17, you just give it to her, no problem. Read now, amen. Colossians 3. Okay, yeah, a bit louder, amen. 3.17. 17, the word of God says that, And whosoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Amen, thank you. So what does it say there? Do all in the Father, Son, and the Spirit. No. What does it say there? <clears throat> Do all in the name of what? Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This is the commandment that we receive from God. Amen. Amen. And this is God's own great. Amen. Bible is God's inspiration. So the word inspiration here means God breathed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so the Bible says, do all things in the name of Jesus Christ, including the baptism, including your child dedications, including the holding the true money, including your building uh, construction dedications. No matter what you do, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. This is according to the Bible. And this is very much the New Testament church doctrine. What does it mean by doctrine? Doctrine simply means teaching. These are the teachings of the New Testament church. Praise the name of God. Amen. Amen. So therefore, my brother, brothers and sisters, therefore we must do all things according to the Bible. And if we are not obeying what is in the Bible, then... Uh, I mean, it's a meaningless. Then if you don't believe in the Bible, you know, what the Bible says, that means you are equivalent to the people of this world. 
That means you're only giving a lip service, you're only claiming to be Bible believing Christians, but in practical, you are not. In other words, we are like hypocrites. That means we claim something and we do totally opposite to what we claim. So, therefore, it is important to understand that even if we just depend on our own a Protestant, Christian, New Testament Bible, we can still see clearly that the early church, the New Testament church, the apostolic church, or the early church knew it exactly, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus, therefore they do all things in the name of Jesus, and they baptize all nations in the name of Jesus Christ. And then we are even taught by some of our Christian leaders and uh, Bible professors and Bible teachers, they say, do not try to understand the Godhead because if you attempt to understand the Godhead, you will lose your mind, and if you deny it, you will lose your service. So when I ask them, what do you mean by this Godhead? They said, what, do we, what we mean by the God, Godhead means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They said they are one but three separate persons. Now even that terminology itself is a very ridiculous. It's a very funny to say that God is three persons because that is not biblical. The term, the terminology you will never see in the Holy Bible. And if you define it, those terminology, God in three persons, that means you are saying that God is three individual human beings. Is God a three individual human being? Because person, what does it mean by person? Try and see from your uh, history. What does it say? Any words? You have a history, go and get it. Amen. Alright, you have a cell phone just type there. In a Google see what is a person. How does it translate in your dictionary? Person is a singular and plural is a people, as I told you in one of our previous class. If it's more than one, then we call them people. If it's just a one individual, then we say person. How does it define the word person? P E R S O N. What does it say there? An individual human being. An individual human being. Human being. Amen. Correct? So Human being. <coughs> According to the Oxford English Dictionary. You see that? More than one individual, we call them people, and if it is just one individual, then we call it person. Person is a singular, people is a plural. Right? Yeah, yeah. Just like men and just like woman yeah. and women. Woman is it one individual, women is more than that. Correct now. So, according to this Oxford Dictionary, it clearly says an individual human being. So when you're saying that God is three separate persons, then you are literally saying that God is three individual human beings. Oh, come on. Alright? You don't have to insult yourself to that level. You don't have to expose yourself to that level. And that's the reason why this Islam apologists and Jewish apologists are laughing at our preachers. They are ridiculing, uh, you know, they are, they, are, they are making jokes. They are ridiculing them. They say these people doesn't know their own Bible. Because according to your own Bible, nowhere in the Holy Bible, from the Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, nowhere those terminologies are there. The Bible never says that God is three separate persons. The Bible never used those terms and terminologies. The Bible says God is one, God is one, there is one Lord, one Holy One, there is one Spirit, okay, one body, all right, one God. Those terms, terminologies can be uh, found in the Bible, but such as God is three persons, is nowhere in the Holy Scripture. 
So when I asked my one of my teacher, what does it, what do we mean by God? And he said, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are one, but they are three separate persons, and they are the part of the Godhead. So that means Jesus is only one part in the Godhead. So they say, therefore, God is one, but yet in three persons. So confusing. And therefore, when we say, how is that possible? If God is one, stick to that and say God is one. So why are you are saying God is one, yet three persons? And those terminologies are not in the Bible. We are not against any denomination. And by the way, we are interdenominational. We don't believe in denomination. We are not denominational. And there is no denomination exists in our institution. Amen. We are simply Bible believing schools. And therefore, we call ourselves biblical assembly. Because whatever you've been taught is according to what the Bible says. Amen. Hallelujah. And we give importance to biblical theology. We give importance to the biblical studies. Because we are Bible believing people. Alright? So therefore they said, it's not Father, it's not Son, Son is not Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is not, but yet it's God, it's God, it's God. But those terminologies are nowhere in the Bible, the Bible never said that. And they said, this is the Godhead. That means you're saying Jesus Christ only one, one, one part in the Godhead. Alright? And uh, when, all, or when all three of them are together, then they become one Godhead. That means one is not complete without others. That means you are saying Jesus is only one part in the Godhead. But what does the Bible say that's more important? According to the Bible, it says totally opposite. Now let us read Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 and 10. Alright? Let us see what the scripture has to say about this. Alright? Let's see from the Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. The Kakini, would you do the reading again? Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 and 10. For in him dwelled all the fullness of Godhead bodily, then, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power. Alright, everybody underline. For in him. H I M. For in him. And according to the context, we all know that the Colossians 2 9 is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Correct? It's not referring to anybody else, but it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. For in him, in other words, in bracket you can write, for in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. All the fullness of the Godhead, not just part. All the fullness of Godhead, bodily. That means, alright, Jesus is not just part of the Godhead, but all the fullness of Godhead is in Christ Jesus. Amen. That means the role of the Father, the role of the Holy Spirit, the role of the Son, it's all in Jesus Christ. That means, according to Colossians 2 9, that Jesus is both the Father, He is the Son, and He is the Holy Spirit. That is according to the Bible. Amen. Otherwise, why would the Apostle say, For in Him, that means for in Christ Jesus, dwelleth all, not just part, all the fullness of God and Bible. And He goes on to say in verse 10, And ye are. Complete in him, which is the head of all the principality and power. Amen. So that means according to my Bible and your Bible, it says that we all are complete in who? Jesus. We are complete in Jesus plus nothing. Amen. Hallelujah. <coughs> we are complete 
in Him, it does not mean we are complete in them. So that means if I have Jesus, then I am complete. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't need any other gods. I don't need to believe in this kind of maybe doctrine as a trying God, this maybe the theory. All I need is to believe in Jesus because as long as I have Jesus, I have everything. Amen. Amen. Because the Bible said you are complete in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. According to the Bible. And therefore, Colossians 3 17 also say that whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So this is something very important subject. Now, now let's go to the historical uh, references now. Okay, for a moment, let us agree that Jesus Christ used this wording. This is a baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even if you still agree that, it does not lead us to any confusion. We can still understand that the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, is Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what the apostles uh, knew. And therefore, they baptized every nation in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Therefore, you will never, I use the word never. You will never come across the baptism in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Every nation, every people, every believers were all baptized in the name of Jesus according to the New Testament. Amen. Amen. Now let's go to these historical evidences, which means we'll study from the encyclopedias and from the Bible dictionaries, and let's try to see what Albert has to say about. The Christians, biblical baptism of formula. All right, now let's talk about uh, the historical records. Let's talk about historical uh, you know, evidences. Because the historical record respected historical sources verify that the New Testament church, or you can say the early church, did not use a threefold Baptism formula or baptism formula, but they involve the name of Jesus in baptism well in the second and the third centuries. I want to go down here with the uh, first source that is from Encyclopedia of Religions and Ethics, which was published in 1951, and volume 2, and the page number 384 and 3896. The formula I used was in the name of the Lord Jesus. Or some synonymous phrase, there is no evidence for the use of the trying names. Now let's go down to uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia. Now even the Roman Catholic Church acknowledged that yes, the early church, the New Testament church, water baptism formula was never in the Father's and Holy Spirit, but rather in the name of Jesus. Now let me read out from word to word from the Catholic Encyclopedia Volume 2, which was in the page number 263. I'm reading, I'm quoting from the Catholic Encyclopedia, page number 263. The Catholic Encyclopedia says the baptismal formula was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit by the Catholic Church in the second century. This is not what I'm saying, but that is exactly what the Catholic Encyclopedia says. So according to the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, they acknowledge that the early church, the New Testament church, baptism formula was changed by the Catholic Church. As I told you yesterday, after the 32580, after the Nicaea Councils, they made a decree that whosoever wants to be Christians and receive the ones to make baptism must join the Roman Christianity and they should receive the baptism only in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not even immersion, it should be only sprinkling and pouring baptism. And if somebody uh, refused to get a baptism of the Father and the Holy Spirit, he or she would be given a, a capital punishment for disobedience. So they would do baptism only like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Like that only. 
They were given to this day the Catholic will pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't it? Why did they touching their forehead? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see? So according to the encyclopedia, it clearly states that the Catholic Church changed the baptism formula from the name Jesus Christ to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not I'm saying that's what the Bible says according to the history. And therefore, every Christian encyclopedias, every Christian's dictionary, and all historical uh, evidences and documents, and all the records proven that the New Testament church baptismal formula was always in the name of Jesus. According to uh, Asking Dictionary of the Bible, it says one could conclude that the or the original form of words was into the name of Jesus Christ or the Lord Jesus. Baptism into the name of the Trinity was a letter development. According to Hasting Dictionary of the Bible, they said the Father, Son, or the Spirit or the Trinity baptismal formula was a letter development. But the early church, the New Testament church, practiced only the baptism in Jesus' name. All right. According to the Daniel side of religions, 970, page 53, or the same person were baptized at first in the name of Jesus, or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Afterward, with the development of the doctrines of the Trinity, they were baptized in the titles of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see that? Therefore, we are saying today, Christians today, or Bible believing Christians today, should use the biblical or the Bible baptismal formula as found in the New Testament. Therefore, we are urging people everywhere to be baptized by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And therefore, the New International Encyclopedia. The volume 22, page number 40, says the term Trinity was originated by Tertullian, a Catholic Church father. Because Tertullian coined the, 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 the word Trinity, and in Latin they call it Trinitus. He was the first man to coin the word Trinity. But before that, no one, no you know, Christians have ever heard of even the word Trinity. It was part of the latter development. There is a reason why I understand, brothers and sisters, it's important that we as a Christian, we should use only the biblical baptismal formula. And I'm sure that we all believe in Jesus. And I'm challenging people who say, I believe in Jesus. All we are saying, if you truly believe in Jesus, why don't you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Amen. If you have no problem praying in Jesus' name, if you have no problem dedicating your house even your garden, even your land, even your church building, even your children dedication, and even for your physical healing, if you have no problem receiving the prayer in the name of Jesus and praying in Jesus' name, if does not offend you, and if you have no problem praying in Jesus' name at all, why are you so reluctant to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? That makes you hypocrites because you have no problem in other matters. You have no problem receiving in a prayer in the name of Jesus. But when it comes to water baptism, why are you reluctant? Why are you refusing? If you're a true believer, you should be glad to immerse in the name of Jesus Christ. Most of you may say, I'm already baptized. But I'm not saying, are you baptized? The question that we often ask is not, are you baptized? Because if I simply say, are you baptized? Everyone will say, yes, I am, including non-Christians. Because the baptized baptize means immersion. Even the Hindu people get immersed in the Ganges River. In order to clean their sins, to receive the forgiveness, they believe that I need to dip myself three times in the names of the Brahma, Vishnu, Siva, in the three Murti, and uh, they would dip inside the water in the river, and as soon as they came out of the water, they said, My sins are you know, forgiven. And even they have that form of baptism. 
So baptism it simply means immersion. So if I say I will baptize, then I'm sure that many, uh, most, most of you would say I am already baptized. So the questions here is not are you baptized, but are you baptized in the Bible way? Amen. Because there's a big difference between receiving baptism and receiving Bible baptism. You might have been already baptized according to church tradition. I'm not asking about church tradition. Even I was baptized according to my church tradition in the titles of Father, Son, and the Spirit. But when I come to know that this is a main doctrine developed after 325 AD Nicaea Council, that after when I study and read from the Bible, that the early church, the New Testament church, practiced only baptism in Jesus' name. All right, after that, the Lord opened my understanding and my eyes, and I received the baptism in Jesus' name in the year 1995 at the Parkai in the Tumukilima River. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of God. Hallelujah. Amen. I was baptized in Jesus' name from Nagaland. Born in Manipur, but I received my spiritual birth from Nagaland. So therefore, I often have this very close attachment with the people of Nagaland. In the spiritual, I received my spiritual birth from Nagaland. And after the pastor showed me that, see, according to the early church, they baptized only in Jesus' name. So aren't you afraid if your former baptism is not found in the Bible? And after that, I said, oh my God, that means I must get baptized according to the Bible way. Amen. And then first I thought maybe re-baptism is a sin. And then when I read Acts of the 19th, there is a clear re-baptism. Paul gave a re-baptism, even to the extent of re-baptism. See, the baptism in Jesus' name is so important that Apostle Paul re-baptized them even to that extent of re-baptism. He gave the baptism twelve to the twelve disciples of the Baptist in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Even to the extent of rebaptism, Paul baptized them in Jesus' name. They were already baptized before at Jordan River because they had already received John's baptism. Even John's baptism was also immersive. Jesus' name baptism was also immersive. Amen. Then why would Paul need to rebaptize them? Why did he rebaptize them? Because though they had received a re uh, immersive baptism, they were not yet baptized in the name of Jesus for the purpose of remission of sins. Amen. So, in order for them to receive the remission of sins, Paul rebaptized the 12 adult men who were known as John's disciples, received the rebaptism in Jesus' name in Acts chapter 19, verse 25. Therefore, in Acts chapter 19, verse 5, said, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So they were understand, guys, when we are, uh, when we start our ministries, it is very important that we must do it exactly like the Bible says. Amen. If the people start coming to Christ, the people start believing in Jesus, and if they are ready for the baptism, don't get confused yourself, my friend. Amen. Amen. You should go and baptize them in Jesus' name. But before we do, my friend, we ourselves need to first undergo, we need to, under, to take the baptism according to the New Testament Bible. Because when you look in the New Testament, the Jews, the Samaritan, the Gentile, the disciples of the Baptist, Apostle Paul himself were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. When you study from Acts 22 verse 16, Apostle Paul himself received the baptism in the name of Jesus. Arise and be baptized. And what's the way that seems calling on the name of the Lord? Moreover, the epistles contain a number of references or allusions to baptism in Jesus' name, including Romans chapter 6, verse 3 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 13, 6 11, Galatians 3 27, Galatians 2 12, and James 2 17. And the only verse of scripture that anyone could appeal to, to in support of threefold baptism from the Lord is in Matthew 20 verse 19. As I told you, that the disciple understood, apostle understood that Christ's words as a description of his own name. Because Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Therefore, we, are, we can see, according to the, the Bible, that the disciple and the apostle understood that the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus. They would fulfill his command by baptizing all the, uh, all the believers and all the nation in the name of Jesus. And according to the Bible, we know there is only one God, and he has one supreme name today. Amen? And what is that? He has only one supreme name and one saving name under the New Testament. And that is the name Jesus. Amen? What about Acts chapter 4 verse 12? Let's turn the Bible. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, there is says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So you can ask any pastor, any theologians, any Bible teacher and Bible professor, ask them graciously, what is the saving name of God according to the New Testament? What is the name of Acts 4 12? The saving name of Acts 4 12? Is it Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Our Lord, 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 our God, 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 or Jesus? According to the context, the only saving name is Jesus. Amen. Look at here in Acts of the 4 verse 10. This is what Apostle Peter declared. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. By the name of Jesus, so Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised him from the dead, even by him to this man, stand here before you all. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Therefore, if you look at the context, the only saving name under the New Testament, what which God has given for our salvation under the New Testament, is only the name Jesus. And therefore, Apostle Peter goes on to say that neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. And also, my friend, very interesting thing is that according to many historical references, historical, historical evidence, that the Kingdom Bible, that Matthew 20, verse 19, the wording itself, Father, Son, and Spirit, it was added after. 32580, and according to many historical evidence, it's been proven that Jesus Christ was literally saying to his disciples, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in my name. So, in other words, he's saying, Go ye all, uh, into all the world and make disciples of all nations in my name. All right? That is according to many historical uh, you know, references. So therefore, according to Eusebius, reflect the verse as you read it from the text and library of Caesarea, the problem with most of including the kingdom verse that it relates to the text of Matthew 20 verse 19, is that they reflect an erroneous addition of wording of the Catholic origin and not a correct word spoken by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As the verse and the doctrine of treaty were being discussed in this day, and having access to original the original Eusebius denounced the reading of Matthew 20 verse 19 with a pretty print phrase as the most serious of all the false, uh, falsification. It is time for the modern to stand to get back to the actual words of the Lord Jesus and for the words as they were actually written in the everlasting gospel in Matthew. Because in the everlasting gospel, Matthew clearly says that going into all the world and make disciples of all nations in my name. Amen. Hallelujah. So the other Jesus was saying, baptize them in my name, not in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. Let's keep aside the historical references at the moment. Even if we just stick with what we have right now available in our hands, even without consulting the Hebrew Bible and Greek Bible, the original Greek and Hebrew Bible, or other early manuscripts, even if we just stick with this Protestant English Bible, the King's own Bible, still, we can still, you know, clearly see 
that according to the the New Testament, according to the New Testament, according to the, the, the work of the apostles, okay, they understood that the saving name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is Jesus, and therefore they began to baptize every day, sir, in the name of Jesus Christ. Even to the extent of re baptism. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, therefore, brothers and sisters, all we are saying is that if we truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now this is not for the unbelievers, but if we truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then all we are saying is that let's get right. Amen. And uh, do the baptism according to the Bible way. Therefore, we are urging all Christians today to use, we must use the biblical baptism formula as found in the Holy New Testament. Amen. Amen. And therefore, we are saying that everyone should be baptized by immersing in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. Amen. Hallelujah. There is something I want to confirm over here. And before we conclude, I just want to remind you one thing. I know that many people are saying, I believe in Jesus. That's great. Thing. But let me tell you, if you claim and if you say you believe in Jesus, no one thing. To believe in Jesus is to believe in the gospel. Amen. Water baptism in Jesus' name, according to the New Testament, is part of the gospel. You cannot run away from it. Amen. You cannot say, I believe, and that's it. I don't want to get baptized. You can't do that. As soon as when Paul believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, for the purpose of his remission of sin, immediately he was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's all turn the Bible and we look at reading. We'll read together and then we'll close for today. Amen. And we'll see you tomorrow. Amen. Alright, let us turn to Acts 22, verse 16. Amen. Hallelujah. Acts 22, verse 16. We can all stand together and we don't have the time to that. Acts 22 verse 16. Can we read louder please? And now why there is thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away the sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And now why there is thou? In other words, why are you waiting? Wait Arise and be baptized. Be immersed. And was with thy sins. Call him on the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we must understand this. That the purpose of Jesus the baptism is always for the remission of our sins. So that we can receive the remission of sins. In order to receive the remission of sins, it is absolutely necessary that we must call upon the name of the Lord and water baptism. We must only invoke the name Jesus. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. And your reading assignment is to study the book of Matthew. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Please read and study and uh, come back tomorrow with the book of Matthew. Amen? Amen. And God bless you. Service to one. One small person.
Wonderful time, Lord Father God. Father, this very evening, Lord Father God, whatever we have learned, your word, Lord Father God, allow us to keep in our heart and mind, Lord Father God. Amen. Bless each and every Praise one of us, Lord Father God, this evening, Lord Father God. Father, as we are going to move on from these very places, Lord Father God, until and unless we meet in this same manner, Lord Father God, may your same protection and guidance be upon each and every one of us. We commit all this prayer into a mighty hand. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, brothers.